and to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to church. Will you stand as we go before the Lord in worship? Um, I was in Oregon this past week, and I was just blown away by... um, I listened to a song about Oregon that said, I've never seen a greener green than that. And I was like, let's see if it's true. And it's true, all the different shades of green, but I was just blown away by the mountains and the trees. And we went to a zoo and saw animals and um, just like the differences in um, all of God's creation that just stood out, blew me away. Um, And so I'm excited to worship this morning. Um, We'll start with how great thou art and just praise God for... um, the stars, the rolling thunder, the universe, um, all the world that, the ha- that God's hands have made. And so, um, would you hear this call to worship from Psalm 66? It says, let the whole earth shout joyfully to God, sing about the glory of his name, make his praise glorious. The whole earth will worship you and sing praise to you. They will sing praise to your name. So let's do that together this morning. Oh 
Welcome to Harvester Online. I'm Pastor Jen, and I'll be with you all night tonight over in the chat. So if you want to talk, if you got any questions or comments that you want to drop in, just uh, put them in, and I'll be there to, to help answer. Today, we're going to be hearing from Pastor Johnny. Now, we don't get to hear from Pastor Johnny very often. Pastor Jason is still on vacation. Um, and he's, he's going, Pastor Johnny is bringing us a message about, from Revelation which is always a scary book and always a scary uh, thing when we see Revelation. I was actually talking to somebody on Sunday about the service, and she's like, yeah, I, I just don't like Revelation. It's, it's big and scary. It's not scary, okay? Revelation is basically um, apocalyptic literature. So it's telling us about what's, what to expect during the end times, except it does it through symbolism and we're not entirely sure what any of the symbols uh completely mean but where he is he's in the very beginning of the of the uh chapter of the book in uh chapter three and this is part of where uh john is talking to each individual church uh, in the area and part of uh part of that is the church at laodicea and i think I think that there's a lot of good information for us to think about during uh, when we talk about the Church of Laodicea because they they have a lot of the same issues that I think we do as well. And so it's a real interesting sermon. I can't wait to uh, to experience it with you guys after the service. We're um, I'll come back here. We'll close up, and then we'll see you next week. I am so excited to be up here this morning to. Uh give the word that God has given me, and just celebrate a Sunday morning, a beautiful Sunday morning with all of you guys. So last month, as you know, the youth ministry, we took um, some teens to teen camp, right? We embarked on an adventure, whisking away 45 eager teens to the enchanting realm of teen camp. Picture this with me. Crisp mountain air. Play along, Pastor Kayla. Crisp mountain air. Sounds of fun and sounds of terror as the teens are being launched into uh, the river from the blob. I've still yet to try that. I am a little afraid, not going to lie. And the excitement of the ice cream machine that is found in the cafeteria. All these sounds and memories and laughter permeated the air like fireflies on a summer night. Among this... My wife's about to be mad at me because I'm using her as an illustration. So, among this was a vibrant, um, joyful, lovely, amazing person that I like to call my wife, Sabrina. A woman whose laugh is a symphony of delight, unmatched in its exuberance and, I dare say, infectious charm. Sabrina's laugh is no ordinary sound, if you've heard it. It's a cascade of pure bliss that ripples through the air, compelling everyone within earshot to join her in a harmonious chorus of happiness and laughter, right? It's a kind of laugh that can turn the darkest day into the brightest sunlit afternoon. I may be a little biased, but I think people can agree on that. But beware, because her laugh can be dangerous. It is very loud. It is very genuine. Those who witnessed Sabrina's laugh at camp discovered a delightful yet hilarious side effect when combined with a mouthful of water. (laughs) So we're standing there in the back of the gym. We're by, I believe, Pastor Kayla and Pastor Jade and some other people right before the nightly chapel service, and we can hear a grand echoing of sounds of camaraderie and competition from the the Nine Square and the Gaga Ball Pit just seeping through the gym doors from outside. When our friend, you know him, Mr. David, I won't share his last name uh, in case he gets mad at me, Mr. David A. just got married. Um, (laughs) You don't know who he is. Hmm. But ever the comedian, he decided to crack a joke at that time. Now, David's timing was impeccable. I don't know what the joke was. I wasn't paying attention. But, uh, that, that timing in Sabrina's mouth at that very moment was brimming with water. As the punchline landed, Sabrina, unable to contain her, her response, erupted into her signature laugh. In an instant, a sparkling spray of water 
burst forth from her mouth, arching through the air, and spraying everything and anyone in its path. The, the guy running the sound looked a little scared for the soundboard, but it was okay. There was no damage. Those who witnessed this erupted in laughter. Again, I didn't know what the joke was. I was laughing at the fact that now we were in the splash zone at SeaWorld. Um, so Sabrina spread out her water as a response to comedic stimulus and perfect timing. But there are other reasons why we might spit out water or a drink, right? Now uh, it even says in scripture, Jesus um, warning a church that he's going to spit them out. So I want you guys to join me today as we read Revelation 3, 14 through 22. It says, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Word, would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today. God, we thank you for um, a beautiful and wonderful Sunday where we can gather together as family, as friends, share some donuts, share some coffee, share some laughter. God, I'm so grateful for this, this family here, but also your bigger worldwide family throughout time and location. God, you are a big God. And I pray that um, you work through today's uh, message, God, and you, you reveal yourself. God, your heart for people, your love for us. And that we go out from the overflow of that love and show that love to the world. We love you and we praise you and in your name we pray. Amen. So Revelation, that's a pretty intense book. It can be confusing, it can be intimidating. That's why I only did a piece of it. I'm not ever, I'm kind of scared of preaching on Revelation. Carol Rotz, a theologian, a scholar, wrote about the complexity of Revelation. She said, as prophecy, it critiques the historical situation and conveys God's guidance to the church. As a letter, its pastoral intent is to warn and encourage people caught in an overwhelming socio-political context. As apocalyptic, it provides glimpses of justice and meaningful living based on the establishment of God's kingdom. As wisdom literature, it challenges the church to be thoughtful and discern its message. So Revelation is a prophetic book. Prophecies we see all over the Old Testament, right? And now we see a prophetic book in the New Testament. And prophecies can be foretelling or they can be forthtelling. So when a prophecy is foretelling, it's saying what is going to happen. It is God working through a mouthpiece saying this is what is going to happen, this is what is going to occur. When it is forthtelling, it's God making a statement through his mouthpiece of what is currently happening in the world, right? Whether it, the church or his people need to repent or things like that. So it is telling about the current situation. Revelation is kind of a beautiful mix of both. It is both foretelling and foretelling. So now the book of Revelation is often called apocalyptic. And it's believed to be just foretelling because, yes, there are predictive elements to the book's prophecy. 
These visions to John while he was on the island of Patmos also speak, though, to the church of that time, not just the future. They speak to the church of that time and the church of today, both with encouragement but warning. In Revelation, there is a huge focus on atonement, so a huge focus on God's sacrifice and why it was important, but also there's a huge focus on the fact that the risen Christ desires relationship with his bride, the people he loves. That doesn't sound too scary. In fact, that sounds very hopeful and joyous. Oh, gosh, thank you. Revelation's not as scary as I thought. There are pieces. But there is also still, with love, that call to repentance for the entire church and faithful witness. There are seven churches written to or spoken to by Jesus in the Asia Minor area in this part of Revelation that we're going to go to. In the message to the other six churches, Jesus included some positive remarks in it. He would give a positive remark and some corrections and all out of love. In this letter to this church of Laodicea, we read no positive remarks, only criticism and correction out of love. So let me give a little context to the city of Laodicea. It's located, what we would see as like modern day Turkey in the valley. It's surrounded on its north side and its south side by mountains. So it's kind of in a valley. Laodicea was though a commercial center. It was a hub. They were a thriving medical and textile industry base for the world at that time. So they had money. It was financially prosperous. Around 60 AD, there was a major earthquake that brought destruction to that area, including Laodicea, but also other cities. And they had, um, the other cities accepted government help to rebuild and get back on their feet, whereas Laodicea rejected it and boasted about its wealth and about its resources. It boasted on having everything controlled themselves. They don't need help from anyone. So to grasp the importance of Jesus' warning to spit out the church of Laodicea, we have to understand what lukewarmness even means. To help paint a picture, I've asked some of my friends to come up and do an illustration for me. And I have my wife come up and uh, give me my illustration. I may or may not have went to Walmart. I didn't. I just had a Walmart bag. But I have my friends here, some teens, and Mr. Chance. I have three different uh, kinds of coffee I want them to try real quick. I'm going to give you each a straw. I'm going to have you try the coffee. Pretty simple, right? Then at the end, I'm going to ask you guys, which one was your favorite? Which one was the worst? This is hard to get my finger in. There we go. Boom. So I'm going to pretend they're not here and they can't listen to me. One of them is hot, fresh coffee that I got downstairs right before service. One of them is a nice cold brew that I had stewing overnight, and it's beautiful and delicious. You can't hear me. The last one looks a little separated if you look closely. It's a bit lukewarm. I left it on the counter overnight, um, but I bet it's so good. I bet it's amazing. So, I'm going to start with the cold one. I'm just going to give it, pass it down, and the chance, if you would, come and bring it back to me when you guys are finished. It doesn't have to be a big sip. Yes, no, we keep your straw. Thank you for reminding me. You're going to use it for all of them. And while you guys finish that, <laughs> you don't like coffee, Isaac. Good, perfect. Thank you for being up here, friend. So I got a hot one. It's not too hot, so you shouldn't burn yourself. <laughs> you okay? Thank you, thank you. So now I got the hot one going. <sighs> Don't take a big sip of this. Maybe not go all the way in, because you'll get coffee grounds. Um, it's separated, and I don't want to shake it. So take a sip and pass it on. Do you need a new straw? Okay. Was that your favorite, Isaac? 
Was that your favorite one? So good. <laughs> Do you want to chug it? <laughs> okay, so um, quickly tell me your favorite and your least favorite. Noe? So hot was the best, lukewarm was worst. Cold is the worst. Okay. Mr. Isaac. No. <laughs> you ruined my illustration. <laughs> Brock. Like the hot one, pretty cold, pretty bad. Pretty bad. I haven't tried it. I'm not going to. That's why I brought you guys up. Chance. The hot one is the best. Yeah. Lukewarm. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. You can keep your straws. Happy Sunday. <laughs> Have the bag. Thank you so much, guys. So that's just a fun little illustration that I want to share with you because one, I really like coffee. And two, I thought it'd be fun to kind of give a demonstration of lukewarm through coffee. So now none of them spit it out, which, thank goodness, I was afraid because I don't think Pastor Jade or Carl would be too happy with coffee stains on this beautiful carpet. So thank you for not spitting it out. But even though they didn't spit it out, they didn't find it pleasant. So I want to do a quick poll. It's really quick. I want you to raise your hand. I'm going to ask you which one you prefer. A hot coffee, a cold coffee, or a lukewarm that's been sitting on my kitchen counter overnight, or one that you forgot about on your office desk because you got sidetracked and you had 50 other things that you had to do and then you came back and you're like, oh yeah, I have coffee. Okay. So, and if you don't drink coffee, make it water or tea. Some people like hot water. So if you like hot coffee, raise your hand. Cool, cool, cool. And this is not a trick question. If you like cold coffee, raise your hand. I'm a cold coffee guy, no matter what time of year. If you like lukewarm, raise your hand. Is RP, are you raising your hand for lukewarm? Cool. Okay. I love it. So we see that from the poll and from the people up here, hot coffee and cold coffee are kind of the, the preference, right? So to truly grasp the concept of lukewarmness, I think we need to dive a little deeper. So it's not just a beverage preference. It's a, I think anyone really, except RP, would spit out lukewarm coffee. If I had it on my desk, I might spit it out without realizing what I'm drinking. I, I, would, I would even take a guess that if Jesus had it, he would spit out the lukewarm too, because lukewarm coffee. So in Revelation, Jesus begins his letter right here to the Laodiceans by establishing his authority. We read that he reminds the church he is the amen. He is a faithful and the true witness and the beginning of God's creation. Then he now addresses the church, condemning their works neither as hot or cold, but he says that they are lukewarm. And that term is pivotal here. He wasn't expressing his preference on coffee. He wasn't saying, oh, I like iced coffee better than I like a a hot espresso. Nor was he suggesting even a preference for spiritual coldness or spiritual hotness. Instead, he was using this imagery that was drawn from the local context of the city's water supply. Being in that valley, the city was notorious for its lukewarm water. Lukewarm water, if you don't know, back then is unsafe and unpleasant to drink. Had a lot of, like that coffee, the lukewarm had a lot of sediment on the bottom. But its neighboring cities, like I'm going to butcher these names. I'm sorry. I practice these names, but still. Hierapolis had a hot spring nearby. They gave nice, hot, safe water. And then another neighboring city had refreshing cold water that they had access to. And then there's the lukewarm city that boasts about their riches, boasts about their wealth, and that lukewarm water. So similarly, Jesus likened the church to their city's water, tepid and ineffective in making disciples and being the church. The Laodiceans would immediately understand the dangers of lukewarm water. They would understand the gravity of the imagery that Jesus used here as he spoke through John. Therefore, it's no surprise that Jesus uses this imagery to connect to their heart so they can better understand their own spiritual state. So hot didn't necessarily mean on fire for God. That's not what Jesus is saying here. And cold doesn't mean against God here, right? 
because we saw that hot water and cold water were both good, and then they're there with the lukewarm. So rather, I want you to think of the imagery more as hot being passionate, zealous, ready to do everything, just ready to go, serving. And I want you to think of cold water as refreshing, invigorating, encouraging with your words, with your actions, being that friend. Jesus was saying you're you're neither of those characteristics. You're lukewarm. Their spiritual life was marked with complacency and indifference. They went through the motions, but their heart wasn't set on God. It was set on their reputation and their finances. They relied on their resources and didn't rely on even the government or even God. We got this, he said. But Jesus is saying a lukewarm faith isn't just ineffective. It's distasteful. It means I don't have your heart. You could be going through the motions, but I don't have your heart. I want to be in relationship. I want you to rely on me. I want to hold you as my child. He desires our full commitment from that time to now to the future. He desires our full heart, not just Sunday mornings, not just Wednesday nights, but he calls us to be hot and cold for him every day of the week, to live for him, to worship him, to delight in his presence continually. I like to joke around that when I was a kid, um, that young, young as a kid, I, my family were CEOs um, of church. We were Christmas, Easter only. We were lukewarm. We were lukewarm. And I remember the time that I saw my dad getting hot, getting steamed, getting boiled, whatever you want to call it, and then it spread to my mom. I remember, I don't know what caused it, but I prayed for it for a long time. Because when I was in high school, and I finally got that license, you know, that, that permission giving to drive a, a deadly vehicle, um, <laughs> I went to church whenever I could. My youth group was my family. The older people were my community. They were people that fed into me. And I lived in that, that presence, and it spread, and my family joined, and um, we went from lukewarm to boiling hot. When we become lukewarm, we're merely just going through the motions. And I know I've been there. And I know a lot of people have told me that they've been there. They're like, oh, I'm doing everything I thought I needed to do, but I feel like God's so far from me. That's a really heartbreaking place to be in. I thought I read the Bible enough. I thought, like, I'm going to church. Like, I'm, I'm serving in, like, the kids. Like, why do I feel so distant? But then the rest of the week, you're living out your life like you don't even remember who Jesus is and what he's done for you. You go to work. Maybe you have um, some choice words in your vocabulary that don't necessarily glorify God. Maybe you're arguing with some random stranger on Facebook, and then they go to your Facebook page, and they see a verse, a Bible verse on there, and then that really confuses them. But our hearts have to be in it, right? And this brings me to my second main point this morning, is be aware of the cause of lukewarmness. In Revelation 3.17, Jesus pinpoints the cause of the lukewarmness for this church in Laodicea. The verse states, for you say, I am rich. So Jesus is saying, quote, what they're saying, I am rich. I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing, now Jesus is saying, not realizing that you were wretched. You were pitiable, you were poor, you are blind, you are naked without me. A group that was very wealthy and self-reliant were very blind to the true state of their hearts and their souls because their material wealth gave them this false sense of security. Oh, we didn't need help rebuilding the city. We didn't need the government's help. We didn't need anyone's help. We had the money. We got the labor. We got the resources. But they were blind to the state of their souls. They could not recognize their need for a savior to come and transform them, to make them new, to really hold on to their heart and love them. Because their pocketbooks were still looking pretty amazing. And while they boasted about their resources and finances, Jesus straight up exposes their true spiritual condition. He held nothing back. He didn't sugarcoat. I had a boss that was very straightforward and blunt, and he would say, ain't no sugar in my factory. 
I didn't understand that at the time, but I've learned. But <laughs> he was saying contrary things to their claims of wealth and self-sufficiency and resources. Jesus described them as wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. That's interesting characteristics for a city that claimed to need nothing. This stark contrast highlights the dangers of relying on worldly riches and self-sufficiency, leading to a lukewarm faith that is so distasteful to Jesus. So we must remain vigilant. They must remain vigilant. We do. And the church, until Jesus comes again, must remain vigilant, ensuring that our reliance is, was, and always will be on Christ alone, not on a set of lists of actions or deeds or a checklist or a chore list. Oh, I read the Bible three times today. I mean, that's great. That helps you get closer to God, but God still wants your heart. It took me forever to figure that out. I love checklists. I love saying, oh, I did this, I got this done, I got this done. Well, well how's your relationship with Christ? I mean, it's good, I read the Bible. But he didn't really have my heart. He wants us to rely not on our achievements, our material possessions, our titles. He wants us to rely on him for every piece of our life. You may be asking, Pastor Johnny, how can I remain vigilant against lukewarmness and staying boiling hot? Well, if you were asking this, I was playing the VeggieTales song in my head. Well, we got a show for you. <laughs> That's, I wasn't going to say it, though. I know uh, Jenny hates VeggieTales. She's over there shaking her head. But it just popped in my head. We got it. Well, well, again, if you say, Pastor Johnny, how can I remain vigilant against being lukewarm? How do I know when I'm just going through the motions how do I stay vigilant? And when I'm lukewarm, how do, I, how do I boil my coffee? I would say the first step is to take time to walk with God. You have to analyze with him and the discernment of the Holy Spirit the condition of your soul on a regular basis. Have constant check-ins with you and God. That's healthy and that's vital for a thriving spiritual life. It's vital to hear from God and see areas where you can grow, where he wants you to grow, and where he wants to move using you. He created you with passions, with talents, with even quirks that he is so excited to use when you give him your heart. So it's an opportunity to self-check in to reflect on your spiritual temperature. So it's not necessarily a thermometer. You are checking it, but it's to be used as a thermostat when you go and you check and then you adjust, right? So it's not just, oh, my soul's not well today. Okay. But it's going to the, the thermostat. It's, it's too lukewarm. I need to turn it down. I like it at 60 degrees. All right? I do. Sabrina gets cold. So this check-in, I got a, some questions for you that might help. These are things that I do with myself that I wanted to share with you. First is, are you passionate about your faith? Or do you feel like you're just going through the motions like a robot on autopilot? And so to explain that a little bit, are you coming to church on Sundays because that's just what you do? Or are you coming into service with an excitement to see God in a new way, to have God reveal his love for you, to keep you going and to spread that love? Are you excited to come, or is it, oh, I have to wake up in the morning and come? I mean, there's no, no shame or condemnation if that's what it is. But I wanted you to go past that. Right? Sometimes the beginning is just showing up. But I want you to be excited. God wants you to be excited to meet him. and He wants to meet you where you're at. Are you standing in worship because everyone else is standing? Or are you really excited about the truths that we are proclaiming as a body of Christ about Christ and his love and his mercy and his joy? And are you letting that infiltrate your heart as you reflect back on the ways he's intervened in your life? Do you talk to God when nobody is around, or do you just wait for someone else to pray in a public group? These are ways I check if I'm passionate about my faith. Uh, when's the last time I actually have a conversation with my father? <laughs> okay. I need to do that. Not need to. I want to, and I get to. Number two, are there areas of your life where you need to surrender to God? In other words, have you tried to Keep a sense of control over something in your life that is actually keeping you in bondage. Is it 
financial security or fear lack thereof? Is it your career? Is it your time? Your schedule? Is it an, your will in an area where you say, ah, oh, God, I don't need your guidance here. I got this. Like the church did with their finances and their church itself. God, I got this. I'll call you when I need you. Hmm. It's hard to give up those areas when we think we have control, but it's just an illusion. We got to move seats in the car and let Christ have all control. Is there something that's blocking you from truly recognizing or understanding and appreciating that God fills that need in our life, in every aspect in our life, that he saves us and loves us, and we are called to go out and be in the world? Not of the world, but in the world. Number three, Jesus is always ready to enter our lives more fully, but are you willing to open the door to him God has given us free will, which means we, we have choices. And we have choices every day. Are we going to give our heart to Christ? Are we going to follow through with what he's called us to do? Are we going to use our gifts, talents to serve? Are we going to glorify ourselves? Are you willing to let God open the door and own your house, who you are, your life? Are you giving him control? So, I'm so appreciative of God's mercy and grace and love. Sometimes I have to step back and do this check-in and check with my heart because sometimes I get ungrateful. Like, oh, man, that's an inconvenience. Oh, man, I don't want to do that. But I'm like, oh, yeah, God's my Savior. He brought me out of where I was. But he's not just my Savior. I have to remember he is my Lord So I'm so grateful for his sacrifice on the cross. But because I love him, I'm now obedient to what he has called me to do because he is my Lord, Lord and Savior. It's still not about checklists and rules, but it is about what the Holy Spirit is telling me to do. So I'm obedient even when it's hard, even when I want to throw a tantrum and I don't want to. Oh, I gotta wake up early for that. Okay, but God, you called me to do that. So give me the peace, give me the strength, give me the energy, give me the perseverance to do this. I'm not relying on me because I know I can't do it. Oh, God, this person really hurt my, my feelings a lot. If you know me, I'm a very, very sensitive person. I have big feelings and I feel sad and I heartbreak very easily. And that's when I have to go to God and be like, God, I'm really sad. I don't know how I'm supposed to love this person when I'm in in pieces. So I'm giving that to you. And then I pray for that person's blessings. I pray for my heart to soften and I can see people through his eyes. I learned that in early recovery. There was a lot of people that hurt me a lot that I blamed for my addiction and that wasn't the case. They were my actions, my choices. But all this hurt, I passed on. And so I had to be obedient when God said, forgive them, love them, serve. And then I have to be obedient when Jesus said in the Great Commission, go out and make disciples of all nations and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So after you do this checklist, and if you find your spot in an uncomfortable, lukewarm, how do, we, how do we heat that up? So Jesus explains a cure to the church right after he, he um, brings it to their attention. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Jesus is there offering true wealth, or as he said, gold refined by fire. So not the riches of this world, but he's offering them spiritual riches that are so much greater, that don't run out. He then offers them righteousness through him, or as he says, white garments to cover up the shame of their nakedness. He says, let me cover you. 
That shame is going to keep you down. I got, I got white, pure garments for you. And then he offers spiritual insight when he says, I salve to anoint your eyes so you can see the world with his heart. Jesus reminds them that his correction and his discipline comes from a place of love because he loves that church. He loves them so much, he wants them to be righteous. He wants them in community, he wants their heart. And so, from those uh, check-in point questions, if you find yourself lukewarm at any point, just remember to take a step back and look at these steps. The first one that we see in scripture is pursue true riches by investing in your relationship with God and your church family. True riches come from relationship. Place God as the focus of all you do. Let his calling to love and serve trump your preference or your tiredness. Take time to speak and hear from God in prayer and in his word, but also be committed and consistent to showing up in your local church body and serving your family, serving the community, serving everyone you interact with. Be a part of their lives in a deep way, way past the walls of this beautiful building that we are blessed with. Be a part of each other's lives in celebrations. Celebrate milestones and victories with each other. And also help carry each other's burdens and care for each other in times of struggle. We at Harvester do great with that. I've seen so many people have so many surgeries in the year that I've been here, and our church steps up to love in tangible ways. Visits, foods. There's been people that have... Um, had a lot of medical emergencies or people that have passed away and our church is there to carry that burden and does that amazingly. You guys are living out being hot and cold. So celebrate victories and milestones, carry each other's burdens and truly invest in relationships. And it is an investment because every human will have an opportunity to fail you. But God doesn't. But when you invest with others who God has called you to love, it is so worth it. Number two, seek his righteousness and ask him to open your spiritual eyes. So fully submit and trust in God's goodness. Listen to the Holy Spirit's direction and at times, even when it's uncomfortable or you don't want to do it, correction. Let him soften your heart in areas that you need softened. Also let him uh, make you zealous in areas that you need to be zealous in. We as the Church of the Nazarene do that really well too. Practice seeing others again in the world in situations through the worldview of scripture. We talked about that in Youth Sunday School. We did a series called Lenses where we, I presented common worldviews that this generation is exposed to. Well, I just want to be happy. Or I'm a good person. I don't need Jesus. And then we visited what scripture says. Happiness is like running on a treadmill. You're going to keep trying to run, and then you'll never get to the destination of total happiness. And then I explained what joy is. We talked about things of, yeah, we might think we're more connected, even though we're the most connected generation via social media. We're still, statistics have shown we're the loneliest generation. And I'm not just saying people in the church, I'm saying the generation, because we're so disconnected, especially after COVID. Number three, let God's discipline lead you to repentance and renewed zeal. So once the Holy Spirit has revealed to you what is there keeping you lukewarm in your faith, remove that barrier. Let God have control, repent from it, and redirect your gaze to the cross. Remember that sacrifice that Christ made for you because he loves you and wants your heart. Let that remembrance of that truth excite you, lift you up, encourage you so much that you can't contain that joy and that love and it just radiates off of you. Have the boldness to live out your faith in everything you do, in every conversation you have, even in the thoughts that no one hears but just you. Let yourself have that boldness to be on fire for God, even if it doesn't make sense to other people. So Jesus ends this message to Lacedo, sorry, Laodicea with a loving invitation to be in relationship with him. 
Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. Jesus is knocking at the door of our hearts, constantly inviting us to go deeper and deeper into his love. So I'm going to close up, but friends, Jesus' message to the Laodiceans is a call to every Christian. It's a call to every church, every denomination, every country, every culture to not settle for lukewarm faith, but to recognize constantly and appreciate our need for Christ and his sacrifice so that we embrace his discipline and we pursue a passionate and committed relationship with our Savior. Open the door to him today and experience the fullness that this world can't give you. I've tried. I've tried to get fullness from this world. I couldn't find it. I haven't met anyone who has. But I've met people who found fullness in Christ alone. So, I'm going to take this time and invite the worship team back up. But I also want to invite you guys, if you haven't accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning, but you are wanting to take that step, I want to remind you these altars are open And there's people in this church, in this community that love you and are excited and want to share that moment for you. If the Holy Spirit's working on your heart about something that is keeping you lukewarm and you need to lay it at the feet of your Savior, the altars are open. Prayer is the most powerful and the greatest tool we have, both as a weapon against darkness and the principalities of darkness, but it's also a tool for us to be encouraged, for us to share, for us to serve, for us to live in community. Prayer is so powerful. Let's pray. God, oh God, I am so grateful for a God that wants my heart. Personally, there's nothing that I can do to be quote unquote good enough or to earn your love. But God, you want our hearts. You want us. You knew each mistake we would ever make, each hurt we would ever feel or cause, and you still said, hey, this is my creation. I love you. God, we thank you that you love us enough to bring us into a relationship with you so we can grow and follow you. God, I pray that this week we do that checklist and we see, am I lukewarm? And what is keeping me lukewarm? I don't want to be on fire. I want to be passionate. I want to be cold. I want to inspire and encourage and reinvigorate others. God, I pray as we leave these, these doors of this building, God, that we continue to serve and love and be in community and live the life you have called us to live in every aspect of our life, not just Sunday morning. God, we love you and we praise you. And in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We invite you to stand as we respond.
Church, as we go from the church gathered to the church scattered, hear and receive this word from 1 Thessalonians. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. Go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. Several years ago, I worked with a pastor who said that he thinks people today, especially if you're if you're in a middle class, upper middle class, or higher uh, neighborhood, people just don't think they need God anymore. And it's a it's a it's a scary and it's a sad truth that we don't we see ourselves as being our providers. We see ourselves as being the ones who are responsible for everything that happens to us. And because of that, a lot of times we forget that we have to give gratitude to, uh, to God. As I've been going through the Minor Prophets uh, over the last several weeks, my, I'm leading a small group that's going through them. And as I've been going through it, one of the things that's really stood out to me is that one, one sin that the people in ancient uh, Israel did was ingratitude. They would literally get the, you know, get all the blessings from God. God had promised to bless them and he did, but then they would go and they would, they would worship Baals or they would worship the sun gods or they would worship whichever other gods were around them. Literally participating in temple worships and all the things that went on there. I won't talk about all of those. And I think to, to a certain extent, we do the same thing. In our hearts, we do the same thing. We accept the blessings that God gives us, but we sometimes forget that it's God that gave them to us. You know, if you if you read the devotion for this week, I I admitted that I forgot. I I bought a new tool. I've got this new table saw that I'm really excited about, and I wanted to show it off to everybody. But I don't think when I bought it, I don't think that I actually thanked God for it for the resources that let me uh, that let me buy it. Um, I've got some big plans for it, and they're all, most of them are pretty altruistic, but, um, but I still have the, the need to recognize that it was God that gave me the, the resources, that it was God that provided that, uh, that table saw for me. And so, you know, I've, obviously I have uh, thrown up a, a quick thank you to God, and I have worshipped him for it, uh, because he is my provider. But it's easy... It's easy to forget that at the time, and and I think, I think if we're really honest with ourselves, we find ourselves in that uh, in that situation more often than we should, we should. So uh, this week, watch out for that. Watch out for that, and make sure that you're that you're giving God credit and you're you're giving Him gratitude for the things that you have, even the little things that you you just don't think about. That's all we've got for you this week, and so next week, uh, Pastor Jason will be back, and we're going to start a new sermon series called People, where we're going to be talking about how to uh, deal with difficult people. 
which probably includes uh, each of us. So it's going to be an interesting uh, series. We'll see you next week.